This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Lithium-ion batteries are great. They power much of the world around us and in our pockets. But trying to scale the technology up for the grid and storing massive amounts of renewable energy is challenging. Limited battery cell supply and manufacturing, difficulty supplying enough rare earth metals and minerals to make the lithium-ion cells, and questions around longevity. But what if there was another way? A method that used air to store energy. This could change everything. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. I spent a lot of time on the channel diving into energy storage technologies and different kinds of batteries, like lithium ion and flow batteries. They're absolutely essential to making renewable energy work as our primary energy source. Without energy storage, we're wasting vast amounts of energy and energy potential. When we can't use all of the energy that solar and wind are generating at the time they're making it, we actually have to turn those systems off. It's called curtailment. When you see wind farms with turbines that aren't turning, that's why. But before we get to how air might be able to solve this energy storage problem, I can hear you already. <laughs> but what about lithium ion batteries? Well, we're seeing lithium ion batteries installations starting to pop up all over the place. One of the more notable examples is Tesla's Hornsdale Power Reserve, which was recently expanded by 50 megawatts. It's helped to improve the electrical system's resilience and reduce the cost of frequency-controlled ancillary services by about $116 million in 2019 alone. But so far, these battery systems are designed for two to four hours of energy storage. Solar and wind are some of the cheapest methods of generating electricity today at around $40 and $29 per megawatt hour, respectively. But when you add in lithium ion battery storage to solar or wind and calculate the cost, it's around $150 per megawatt hour for four hours of energy discharge capability. The price doesn't scale well the larger you make the system, and that's where the power of air comes in. But before I get to the how, I'd like to thank today's sponsor Squarespace for not only sponsoring today's video, but for powering my website. I've been using Squarespace for years now to run several websites, the Undecided website being one of them. It's easy to publish articles and videos, and even easier to customize and fine tune the look and feel to get something that fits your personality and company's brand. And you don't have to worry about software updates or web servers or anything like that. The all-in-one platform is my favorite part. If you want to build out a beautiful web presence without the hassle, head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Matt Farrell to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks to Squarespace and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now, liquid air energy storage or cryogenic energy storage is using a process that's been around for a very long time. The basic principle is very simple. Using energy to compress air down to a small space, and when you need energy, you release that air, letting it expand, and turn a turbine to generate electricity on the way back out. It's not that different from pumped hydro storage. The big difference is that you aren't limited by geography because you can build these anywhere. And there's far less impact on the environment since you're not redirecting water and building up massive facilities. I had a chance to chat with the CEO of Highview Power, a company that's specializing in cryogenic energy storage, sometimes called liquid air batteries. What Highview Power has been doing the, during the, the first 15 years of life, the company is, is close to 16 years old, uh, has been to develop a technology that is integrating processes that are very well known, uh, like liquefaction of gas. So what we are doing is liquefying air, I mean, taking the air that we are breathing and storing the energy in, by the means of, of, of an a fluid, it's a cryogenic fluid, that is air that is that is in liquid state. So it sounds like, I mean, for a normal person in the city or in the countryside, it sounds like very strange liquid air. But I mean, we're doing that since middle of last century to produce nitrogen, to produce oxygen. So we're cooling down the air, separating the different components to produce oxygen for hospitals, oxygen for industries, nitrogen for industrial applications. And, and we are using that engineering to store energy. The process takes the air in around us, cleans and dries it, and then cools it down to negative 196 degrees Celsius, which shrinks the volume by a factor of 700 times. That means you're taking 700 liters of ambient air and freezing it down to one liter of liquid air. This liquefaction process has been around for 100 years and is known as the Claude cycle for the French inventor George Claude. In fun fact, he also invented neon lights by using neon that was a byproduct of his air liquefaction process. When you freeze air into a liquid, you aren't storing high pressure air because it's frozen. So you're storing frozen air in insulated, low pressure vessels. Warming the air back up and releasing it through a turbine generates the electricity. 
The energy efficiency of this process on its own, the energy in versus the energy out, it isn't that great. According to the Institute of Mechanical Engineers, the process can be as low as 25% efficient, a far cry from a lithium ion battery that's between 80 and 90% efficient. But that's not the whole story with these systems. When you layer in capturing waste heat and cold that's generated by the liquefaction process, you can drive that efficiency up to 60 to 70% or even higher. Theoretically, as you know, this is about uh, cooling down, extracting the heat, storing the heat, and reusing that heat again when you gasify. So you can isolate the whole system, and isolating means investing in isolation, I mean, to the point that you can have, I mean, you never have 100% efficiency, but you can have as, as large as you want. So, so what Highview has been doing is standardizing the system, making it modular, so that having a standard product, a standard solution that has 60%, 60, 60%, that you can invest more and get it bigger, and you can invest less and get it lower. And, and I like to highlight that the, the pump hydros and the, and the hydro plants are in that 50 to 60 to 70 percent efficiency of the whole system. To break down how this works for Highview Power's facility, they capture the waste cold that comes out from the thawing process when releasing the air. The cold is then reused during the next cycle's freezing process with new air. In the same vein, they're capturing the waste heat from the freezing stage to reuse during the thawing stage. When repurposing waste heat and cold like this, you can pretty much design and scale the efficiency to fit your needs. But as Javier pointed out to me in our conversation, that's not the thing to necessarily focus on. Again, you can really invest in the efficiency, but normally what you are going to look in, because at the end it's all, do you look at efficiency or do you look at dollars per megawatt hour? I, I, I can tell you that I don't know one single person that will look will prefer more efficiency at a higher dollar per megawatt hour. At the end, the efficiency is in the formula calculating the dollar per megawatt hour. So, so how many megawatt hour do I get? At what cost? And you are including the efficiency inside. So, so you will invest more in adding more tanks on having a bigger uh, charge station or a bigger discharge station. And you can really make your charging station bigger or smaller modularly. So you can have 50 megawatts but tomorrow you want to have 100, you just add another module and, and get benefits from economies of scale, the same with the discharge, but especially with the storage asset. Systems like these can be scaled up very quickly just by adding more storage tanks, which can be purchased from existing natural gas supply chains. All of the major components of a liquid air energy storage are built off of components that are readily available. And the larger the system gets, the lower per megawatt hour price gets, something that can't be said of lithium ion. But lithium-ion batteries are great at responding to energy needs within milliseconds. They're excellent for rapid response and fluctuations in energy use, which, like in the case of the Hornsdale Power Reserve, can save huge amounts of money. Cryogenic energy storage hits the sweet spot at a large scale. When you need 4, 6, 12, or even 24 hours of energy storage, then cryogenic air brings in the value. If you look at where the sweet spot is for the major energy storage systems available today, you'll find lithium ion in the 10 to 100 megawatt range and between two to four hours of storage. Right above that, you have flow batteries, which I've done a separate video on if you're interested. I'll include a link in the description. Now, flow batteries have a lower specific energy than lithium ion, but are more scalable since you can easily increase the size of the fluid storage tanks. While the power capability is slightly smaller, they're more than capable of handling four to 12 hours of energy storage. Pumped hydro is the big kid on the block. Being able to easily store one gigawatt of power and offering a full day of energy storage. The Bath County Pump Storage Station in Virginia is a three gigawatt facility with 24 gigawatt hours of capacity. It's absolutely massive. But like I said earlier, that's highly dependent on geography for a storage system of that size. With liquid air, you can build a facility anywhere on a relatively small plot of land and have a system that can scale up to pumped hydro's energy capabilities. Given its versatility, you'd think that this is the ideal solution across the board but it's not. You're not gonna have a liquid air powered smartphone. <laughs> the system really requires scale and it's not as nimble in energy responsiveness as lithium ion batteries. In fact, Highview Power doesn't see this as a choice between lithium ion and cryogenic air storage. I would say that uh, brothers and sisters, we are the we are like the big brother tall and, and probably fat and the other ones are the very fast ones, that quick ones. For us, the competition is to continue doing the same policy is a burning, burning gas, combustion, 
open cycle gas turbines, uh, gas engines, gas turbines, combined cycles, burning stuff to provide power. That's that's the competition of this. It's all about picking the right tool for the job and figuring out what the right mix is for the given area's needs. But when you're talking about a grid scale of energy needs that are over four hours, liquid air batteries make a very persuasive argument for themselves. Which leads me to my last point about availability. When are we gonna start seeing these out in the world? Well, they're actually already here and coming fast, like within the next few years fast. We have another two projects that are entering into execution early next year in, in another part in Scotland, but we have several projects in the US and, and we have something like 40 projects in the pipeline, seven very advanced, one entering execution end of the year. One of the facilities that's underway is not too far from me in Vermont. They're partnered with Vermont-based Encore Renewable Energy to build out a 50 megawatt, 400 megawatt hour, or about eight hours of energy storage system, which will help with curtailment issues in the area. When it comes to modernizing our grid and transitioning off of fossil fuels, the key always comes back to energy storage. Without being able to store energy generated by renewables from the time it's generated to when we actually need it, it won't matter how cheap solar and wind actually get. There's a mix of technologies that are needed to solve this problem, and the deceivingly simple liquid air battery is aligning itself up to be a major part of that solution. The more I learned about it, the more I kept thinking, why haven't we done this sooner? It's such a clever idea built from some tried and true technologies that have been around for a very long time. There's no cutting edge chemistry we need to wait for to make it viable, and it's taking advantage of what's right in front of us, or actually more all around us. So what's your take? Jump in the comments and let me know what you think about cryogenic batteries. And as always, a special thank to all my patrons. All of your support is really helping to make this possible. If you like this video, be sure to check out one of the ones I have linked to right here. And be sure to subscribe if you think I've earned it. And as always, thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.